Hello all, you're watching the introductory guide to playing Line of Battle, and this is video number five. In this video, I want to focus on discussing artillery. We avoided really moving or firing any artillery pieces in the previous videos, mostly because I think that artillery is important enough that it warrants its own video. Obviously, the tactics that are going to be used to utilize artillery are going to be different than those that you would use for infantry, but there are also quite a few different rules that we're going to go over and discuss. All right, so I've pulled up the Last Chance for Victory module. This is not a scenario. This is just some arrangement of counters that I've thrown out onto the map. Uh, you'll see here that I've got some infantry in the center, some Union artillery up on Cemetery Hill, and some Confederate uh, artillery over here in McMillan's Woods. The first thing I want to do is go over some artillery basics before we do anything or move any counters or anything like that. I'm going to turn this guy so that we can see them a little bit more clearly. We've gone over this in the previous videos but I think it's worthwhile since we're focusing on artillery in this video. All of these artillery units are in their unlimbered formation currently. Um, any artillery piece that is unlimbered is unable to move into a different hex. Now I say move into a different hex because these guys are still going to be able to pivot and potentially fire in different directions just because you unlimber in this position doesn't mean that you're then no longer going to be able to reposition those pieces in a different direction. We can get into that a little bit more later. On the back sides of these counters, you'll see that you've got the little carriage symbol. That's going to show that they are limbered. Now, artillery has a different movement point allowance than infantry. If you remember right, infantry has six movement points. Artillery has 10. They're going to have the same issues with moving through rough terrain as infantry, but it's going to be even worse. This is where your road networks are going to become very important. Using these little trails, using uh, these main roads over here, all that type stuff, you'll come to find that artillery can be a little unwieldy and impractical if you're uh, attempting to move it through really rough terrain. Same thing with infantry. You can stack up to 16 SPs in a hex. You'll notice up here I have two stacked units. They have 8 SP, so they're perfectly fine. One thing that is important to keep in mind with artillery that is different than infantry is that artillery units are never considered wrecked. They can be considered small, but they will never be considered wrecked. If you remember right, wrecked is going to be when they take losses that go under half their strength. So if this guy only had one SP left, he would not be considered wrecked, so he would not take those negative modifiers on his morale checks. Um, that's just the way it is, so keep that in mind. I've, I've screwed that up when I initially started playing. But it is important to note that those guys are not going to get those bad modifiers. So let's get into the movement rules for artillery first. Like I said, unlimbered artillery cannot move. So these guys are locked into position along this ridge. They can move freely to change their direction in their turn, and they could still fire if they wish to do so. One thing that's important to note is that unlike infantry, when artillery changes formation, they're going to be paying three movement points instead of one. Um, a unit that's moving, so for instance, if this guy is limbered, he wants to move one, two, three, four, five, and flip over to his unlimbered side, he would not be able to fire in the same turn because he's moved multiple hexes and fired. If he started his turn in this position and hadn't spent any movement points, he would be able to spend three to flip and then would still be able to fire in that same turn. That's a little bit of a tricky one that took me some time to realize. 
Also important to note for unlimbering, artillery can only unlimber five hexes or more away from enemy combat units that are capable of firing with a clear line of sight. This is important um, because it's going to keep you from moving artillery units right up into the face of guys flipping them and firing. Uh, if they can see you within a range of five, no good. So the furthest away that this guy would be able to unlimber from this infantry would be one, two, three, four, five. So this is the closest that he could possibly be with a line of sight and be able to safely unlimber. If there's hills in the way, that changes things. If there's no line of sight, that changes things. If you're in woods, that's going to make it a totally different story because you could have somebody who might be sitting here and he might be sitting here. Well, they don't have line of sight, so this artillery unit would be able to unlimber in that location. It's not strictly based on four or less hexes line of sight also uh, comes into effect with that. So one thing that's going to be very important to keep in mind when playing the line of battle game system is that artillery cannot stack with infantry or cavalry. They're self-sufficient in this game series in that they're assumed to take up most of the hex, most of the frontage, and players aren't going to be able to stack infantry in with those artillery units to absorb hits. That kind of changes the way the game is played a little bit because you're going to want to keep infantry fairly close to artillery. A lot of times they have not so good morale. Surprisingly, this guy's an A right here, Riley. But you'll notice that if they start taking a lot of hits, they can become fairly brittle and you're going to have some major gaps in your line if you don't have infantry supporting them. That's pretty important, so... Players that have played other game systems might find that a little odd. It's really not that hard once you get used to it. Something to keep in mind when you're moving artillery. So let's say this guy starts on the road here. Limbered artillery can change their facing for free. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. You could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice that when I'm changing his facing, it's not costing anything. That will help out because you can limber up and unlimber a lot faster and move to where you want to if you don't have to worry about your facing. Also something to keep in mind, when you are moving in the limbered formation, you are considered to have an all-around rear facing. So... If you're fired upon, you're going to take those negative shifts on your morale checks, and the firing player is going to get positive shifts on the combat table. So what makes artillery different from infantry in regards to combat and firing? Well, I think the answer to that is fairly obvious in regards to what artillery is in general. It's going to give you the ability to fire at longer ranges. If you look on this chart, you'll see all of our different types of guns displayed in this section. And you'll notice that something like the rifled cannon has a max range of 30. Now, the rifled cannon is pretty standard for both sides, the Union probably more so than the Confederacy. But that's going to give players the ability to take shots that they're not going to be able to take with infantry. That's all well and good, right? Uh, but one thing we're going to discuss is ammo. And in this game system, you are going to be tracking your shot and your canister available for your cannons. And you're going to be doing that manually. So you might potentially run out of ammo if you're taking shots at long ranges and getting good hits. If you look down here at the combat column shifts, where we're right here, artillery you'll notice that at those extreme ranges you're going to be getting some pretty hefty shifts left on the combat table. So an R8 rifled cannon that's shooting at range 
30 is going to be taking a four shift left. So one, two, three, four. They're actually going to be firing on the minus A. That's really not that good of a shot. Yeah, you probably aren't going to be taking a ton of those. What artillery is going to give you is the ability to pinpoint some hard spots in your defense, though. Um, canister is king in this game. There are two types of canister that can be used, and if we go back to this chart, you'll notice that we have different canister types listed on the right side of this chart. Uh, so normal or dense. Canister is going to be able to be fired when units are within three hexes. So all of these units right here, this guy's in their frontal arc, and they're with there he's within a range of three. So each one of these cannon would be eligible to fire canister. If he was here, nope, they'd have to fire shot. When I play normally, if I say, okay, I'm going to take this shot right here, I'm going to tell my opponent, all right, I'm firing Napoleons with canister. They have dense canister. We go from there. That way he knows explicitly if I run out of ammo, what type of ammo I was using, all that fun stuff. What makes canister different, you ask? Hmm, well... Dense canister is going to give you a two-shift right on the combat table. So, for instance, that guy that I just said was going to take the shot was on the four to five column to start. Well, if he's a Napoleon, which will look, he's an N4. Sure enough, he is. He's going to get shifted one, two to the A column. Now, those results look much better than those results do. When it comes to firing artillery, your likelihood of running out of ammo is based on how you roll. So let's say we take that A shot on the A column, right? And I roll a 8. Well, there's no special color on the 8 row, ignoring the yellow, because that's just kind of helping you differentiate which row you're looking at. But what we want to look for is the blue and the orange. The blue is going to signify that canister is depleted if you call out using canister and you roll a result that lands in that area. If you roll and land in the orange, it's going to deplete your shot or your canister. So you might take that A shot and roll boxcars and inflict three SP losses on the enemy infantry unit, which is pretty brutal but you're also going to become depleted for ammo for your canister. That's going to require you to refill your ammo in one of two ways. You can either do that by caisson or what's the other one? By battery. And we'll go over those here after we discuss a little bit more about the combat in general. Same thing as infantry, you can only fire with 8 SP out of a hex. Um, if you fire at a target that's outside of where your canister can be used, you have to use shot, so you're not going to get those shifts. Um, what else is important to note here? Okay, so infantry and in column. I discussed when we talked in another video that moving close to enemy units in column was a bad idea, right? So let's say these guys are moving in column. Here they come, moving down this hill. I can, as the Confederate player, be like, oh, wow, I have some great shots at these guys in column. Well, infantry in column are always considered to have rear-facing, which if we look at our modifiers, is always going to give the attacker two shifts to the right. But artillery at range 10 or more do not apply those rear or DG column shifts. So mostly what they're doing is just making a bunch of noise at those ranges. 
they're probably not going to be inflicting massive casualties on these guys in column. If this guy was one hex closer, that would be a fantastic shot because you'd be getting a two shift to the right on him. Um, but in this instance, he's safely out of range. They could flip. They'd want to flip in the line and start moving up. That way, they aren't taking those rear modifiers. Something to note in regards to firing when you have friendly units adjacent. Let's see if I can pull somebody out here real quick just to show you. Let's say that this unit's here and this unit's here. Uh, better yet, let's just say that guy's there. And let's say, okay, I want to take a shot into here. So, we're at range 8, and I want to fire my N4 cannon at that infantry. Okay, that's all well and good, but because I have a friendly unit adjacent to that unit I'm firing at, this is going to be considered a danger close shot. Um, targets at range 5 or beyond are considered danger close if the firing unit has friendly units in a hex adjacent to the target. What this is going to do, I can take the shot, but I'm going to have to apply any combat table loss result obtained against such a target to all stacks of friendly troops adjacent to the target. So if I would inflict an SP loss on that unit, then the 11th Georgia would also have to take an SP loss. Probably not smart to do in most instances, but hey, you can do what you want. Um, let's see here anything else that I want to talk about in regards to combat obviously they must fire through their frontal hexes so this guy would have line of sight down this hex row through that hex row they can't split their fire um, yeah let's talk about counter battery fire. So what is counter battery fire you ask? Well, it's a great way to suppress enemy artillery when you're trying to advance troops up into their face. So what I have in front of us is not a scenario or anything, but let's for instance say that this brigade here is under orders to move to McMillan's Woods and take that position. Well, look at what's right in front of us. A bunch of Confederate artillery. Napoleons are going to have dense canister. That is not a good situation. I've conveniently placed some artillery batteries for the Union up on Cemetery Hill. If only those guys could be of assistance. Well, this is where counter-battery fire comes into play. So let's say I take a shot with... Rorty's battery, and he fires down here at Latham's battery. So we roll, let's say a morale check is inflicted. Perfect. Inflicting a morale check when you're firing with an artillery unit against a defending artillery unit is going to always cause a CBF, which is a little marker that you're going to place on the defending artillery unit. Now these are going to say CBF1 or CBF2, so you can do this up to twice. Each one of those numbers is going to represent a detrimental shift that that player is going to take on his combat table rules during his turn. So let's say that these guys move up, blah, 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 they get up right here, right in the face of these guys. And it switches over to the Confederate turn. And this guy's going to take a shot with his dense canister into the 71st Pennsylvania. Well, we'd be looking. He's an N4. So we'd look at this. And N is a Napoleon. He's going to have dense canister. So he starts on the 4 to 5. He's going to get two shifts for dense canister. But oh, wait. Oh, he's got a CBF marker on him. So that's going to be a detrimental shift back to the left. 
So that's going to put them on the 6 to 8 column. It's a very good tactic to perch your artillery in an offensive position up on high areas so that you can then shoot over your advancing infantry and support them against the defending artillery. Infantry moving in front of artillery is usually not going to end very well just because most of those results on the 6 to 8 A or B columns, even worse as you go further right, are going to be pretty atrocious. Uh, twos, threes, if you get lucky on the D column you can inflict four SPs. One thing to note is that these CBF markers are going to be removed during your opposing player's rally phase. So if it was the Union turn and I just placed that CBF, it would go to the Confederate turn, he would be in his activity phase, it would be affecting him, he'd have his negative shift, but then during his rally phase, he'd pluck that off and we'd have to do it again next turn if we wanted to continue to suppress him. It's a fairly simple little mechanic uh, that has some pretty some pretty big consequences if you don't use it. I really like to use it. I think it, it seems to be a good tactic. I mean, all you need is a morale check. You don't have to inflict an SP loss. You don't have to do anything like that. Just a morale check. Moving on, let's uh, quickly go over artillery leaders. Artillery leaders are unique in that they have a couple special little functions that they are going to allow the player to do. One thing I don't think I mentioned when we were talking about fire combat for artillery originally is that they can only ever target one hex per turn. So if these guys are all moving up here like this in this position and you want to try to take out Webb, you're going to get one shot at him with these guys assuming he's there because if he took the shot into there well then Riley couldn't he'd have to target a different hex Latham couldn't he'd have to target a different hex than those other two did that's just the way the artillery works you can't gang up on one stack artillery leaders will allow you to gang up on one stack uh, if an artillery unit is in or adjacent to an artillery leader and at least one of those batteries that is firing is from his command, then he can target a second and third shot against a single hex. So if he's in this location, he could allow every single one of his stacks in his hex or adjacent to him, they could all fire at Webb's location if they wanted to. That's important because you can really nitpick certain stacks if you want to, they apply their modifiers just like they, any other leader would normally. So if he's got to take a morale check, he's got the minus one. And the three is the command rating, same as all the other leaders. Now one other thing that artillery leaders are going to be able to do are post units. So before we talk about posting, let's discuss how artillery functions within the command system, right? So here we don't have a divisional leader, we don't have a corps leader, we don't have the army leader. When we look at the command structure, or the command radius, this is what we were going off of when we were talking about infantry. You'll notice at the very bottom there's a row that shows RD Battalion. Depending on the game you play, because the games are different, many of your artillery units are going to be part of artillery battalions. These artillery battalions basically can function independently of other units within certain formations. So you'll notice that Henry's battalion is attached to Hood's division. So he's going to have to stay within Hood's divisional radius, but he's going to have the ability to set up his battalion HQ wherever he wants, and Henry's going to have to stay within four, and these guys are all going to have to stay within four of Henry. So what posting is going to allow a leader to do 
is send an artillery battery out to a location that's outside of their command radius. So in order to do this, a leader has to start stacked with a battery in the command phase. He jots down where he wants that battery to go. Let's say he wants to send that battery up to this hill down here. Um, he has to then basically just state, okay, you go there. That battery is going to be able to limber, start paying movement points, and he's going to be able to move to that location and unlimber. Uh, if it later limbers for some reason, maybe, you know, he was forced to retreat or something, it has to move back within normal command radius. This is just something you can kind of do if you're really wanting to get people into certain locations. Uh, for instance, looking down here, let's zoom out a smidge. Maybe you want to get some artillery, I don't know, up on Little Round Top, but your battalion only you know has its HQ over here and you can't get initiative to move it. Well, you could start posting batteries up to there if you wanted to. Maybe you're shooting at the Union flank up here or something like that. I do know that in None But Heroes, that's a pretty important rule because the Confederates have a lot of artillery batteries that aren't associated with any higher formations. I think, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of those leaders of those batteries might have been a little bit bullheaded and basically just kind of did what they wanted. So Longstreet or Jackson would have to run over there and be like, hey, get your ass over to this hill and set up, and that's... That's kind of how that's handled in this game system. I think for the most part, that's really all I have to cover on combat basics. We discussed leaders, we discussed movement. Let's talk here quickly about artillery ammunition. So like I stated, Ammo for artillery is finite in this game series. So let's mix it up a little bit and pull up the None But Heroes Vassal module while we talk about ammo replenishment for artillery. This is the Battle of Antietam. You'll see we've got this lovely Antietam Creek running up the right side of the battlefield here. Um, a lot of Union forces. This is actually the setup for the start of the campaign. Just kind of wanted you guys to be able to see that and take a peek. I know we've been in the last chance for victory module here most of these videos that we've been doing. So artillery ammo replenishment. Let's talk about the two ways that you can replenish your ammunition. The first one is going to be by caisson. This is normally going to be the preferred method that you're going to want to use if you run out of artillery ammunition. So we go to the charts. Let's say we rolled on the combat chart with, who do we want to use up here? Let's say Reynolds. So he's an R6 battery. Let's say he took a shot and rolled boxcars. So he inflicted two SP losses. The defender would take a morale check. But we're also in the orange, which if you remember is going to call for ammo depletion. So let's say he fired shot. Um, in this instance, he's going to need to replace six shot. He's an R6 battery. He's got six guns. He's going to need to replace six of his ammunition. This game pulls ammunition from wagons. Basically, core or armies are going to have ammunition reserves that you're going to need to pull from. Normally what you're going to want to do is mark down what you start with and then you can cross those out and subtract from there just so you keep a running tally of how much ammunition you have available. Last Chance for Victory has physical wagon counters on the map. This game I do not believe has that. I know in this instance we're looking at the Union First Corps up here. Their artillery wagons are assumed to be just off map up here. So they're going to be able to pull their ammunition from location C or D. Now in order to replenish your ammunition by caisson, 
It's simply a matter of being within 25 movement points of where your stockpiles are located. So for instance, we said Reynolds was the guy that ran out of ammunition. We would place a depletion marker on him, and I'd say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to replenish it by caisson because he's well within 25 movement points of C or D. He is not within an enemy zone of control. He does not have a counter battery fire marker on him. And we'll assume that the wagons have plenty of ammunition. Technically, we wouldn't even put that depletion marker on him because at the time he ran out, he would just say, okay, I'm replacing by caisson. He would cross out what his ammunition currently is listed at, subtract six, and he would be good to go. He wouldn't even have to deplete. Um, one thing to note, when you are replenishing your ammunition, make sure that you're subtracting the number of guns on the counter themselves, not just for the counter. Uh, so that's going to take six shot ammunition. In this campaign game particularly, I found that there were instances where I was running out of ammunition. It seems like when you look at it a lot of times, you know, you have a ton of it, but you will start to go through it. You get a lot of those high-end results when you're firing at longer ranges with artillery than you might think. Um, so something to keep in mind. So that's by caisson. As long as you're within distance of where your replenishment is coming from, so in this instance we're going to say C and D, because the trains are considered to just be off map. He's well within that range. He's not an enemy zone of control. Boom, he just replaces it. The second way you're going to be able to replace your ammunition is by battery. By caisson, it's assumed that you have people on the back end bringing forward the ammunition, so the battery isn't really affected and doesn't have to move. When you're replacing by battery, it's assumed that you're too far away from where your stocks are located. That battery is actually going to have to physically go find the ammunition on their own. I believe in None But Heroes, the Confederates might be forced to do it by battery. I could be wrong. It's been a while since I've played it. But let's take a look here and let's just say that uh, Maddox here fires. Uh, let's say he runs out of ammunition and he needs to replace. He has no wagons that are within range. He has no entry hex that has wagons that he's within 25 movement points of. So he cannot replace by caisson. He's going to have to go find the ammunition himself. So in this instance, it's an abstract way of doing it. But you're going to limber the artillery. And they're going to have to move to the formation's headquarters. Uh, so in this instance, his formation is actually uh, an artillery battalion. S.D. Lee's artillery battalion. So these guys would move to the headquarters and then you would check to see if they have a path to get off map. Um, if they do, you just literally pluck those guys off the map, put them off to the side. They're assumed to be looking for the ammunition. If the ammo points are available, you go ahead, you remove the depletion marker that would have been on this guy, so this guy technically would have had a marker on him. He's off map, you would take that off, you would count off the ammo points, you would cross off two because he's got two guns with that unit, and then you would put him on the turn record track an hour later. So on the turn that he comes back, he would appear limbered in the headquarters hex that his formation, or that he belong, the formation that he belongs to. So he would show up here, boom and then he could function normally. So it takes time. Uh, there's special rules for certain scenarios, I'm sure, in regards to that, um, all that type stuff. So I think I'm probably going to be cutting it pretty close on time here in regards to how long I can make these videos without blowing up YouTube when I upload them. So I think I'll end it there. One thing that you may want to make note of is don't hesitate to get online and download my cheat sheet that I've created. This is helpful. I like to use this as a quick reference. 
some of the artillery rules are strung out throughout the rule book. This is going to be a little condensed version of what you'll need to know. We've pretty much covered most of this stuff. There might be some odds and ends things that I didn't go over in here. Uh, one nice thing that I've tried to do to the best of my ability is, you know, if you have questions about the combat and you see something on here, well, I reference the rules numbers so that you can actually go in the rule book and find it. So that might be helpful if you're playing a scenario and you want to take a look at that. If you're going to play none but heroes, you're really going to have a ton of artillery. This is a very artillery intensive game. Um, the Union have a whole bunch of big reserve artillery units over here across the river. Uh, you can take 15 to 20 artillery shots easily every turn if you really want to. Um, I might make a video focusing just on line of sight. I've had a couple requests for that. I just didn't have enough time in this one. But That's where we're at, guys. Artillery, pretty simple stuff. Not too difficult when you add it in with the infantry rules. Still not overbearing. Um, get out there. Play scenario. We'll see what we do next. I know it took me a while to get this one done and ready. I've been a little bit stretched for time here recently. I think in the next video, maybe we'll talk about cavalry, uh, open order units, sharpshooters, that type of stuff. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Have a good one. Bye.